Okay, welcome back. My name is Jesse. I am a tutor in Melbourne and I also make GAMSAT videos on YouTube now as well, mainly for section three and section two. Today, what we're going to be doing is going through some math skills. Um, I've done a few other math skills videos, but this one's going to be looking really, really specifically at logs and exponentials. Um, so people have asked to for me to kind of go into this in a little bit more depth. We're going to be looking at it a lot from kind of an applications base, but we'll start off with some theory as well. So we'll dive right in. I've already got the notes written up. Um, we'll go through them. I'll run through a couple of examples and then we'll, we'll work through them that way. So first of all, um, just as a quick review, uh, I have already gone through these before, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on them. And uh, they're also up on my resources page as well. You'll find at the top of the table with section three questions from all the walkthrough videos. Uh, and then underneath, there's another table with math skills, which I'm going to keep building out as well. There's one with index laws. I don't think I've done the logs one just yet, but uh, index laws is already up and all the laws are written at the top of the page, along with some questions to practice as well. So we've got them all here, use them as a reference. Um, you can write them down, have them in front of you as you go through this. So the, the main ones that we'd wanna look at are gonna be the, the first law here. So we can use this a lot when we're adjusting units. Um, and the same thing with the second one as well, I guess. So for example, if you're wanting to convert kilojoules into joules, you're effectively multiplying by a thousand or 10 to the three. So if you already have something in kilojoules, say 300 kilojoules, and you wanna convert it into joules, you're timesing that by 10 to the three. So if we write this as three by 10 to the two, multiply that by three by 10 to the three, and then we can use that first law and add the powers on those two tens like that. If there are any particular questions with index laws, uh, let me know in the comments, but I don't really want to clog up the video with, with those. Uh, it's also freely available everywhere. Like you can just Google index laws and kind of review them. Um, I'll let you go through those at your own pace. With the log laws, you can see I've tried to line them up. There's equivalent log laws for um, index laws as well. It's a good way to study them. Again, it's not a straight up maths exam, but they do use underlying maths principles throughout. So the most important or the most common is going to be the third law, which is bringing this power here down to the front and then switching it back again. You can see it here. So this has done a lot to actually go through solving and simplifying log expressions and equations. So look out for that one. I'll point that out as we go through. So first of all, we're just gonna go through here, understanding index form versus basic numerals and why we wanna express everything in index form where we can. So the index form is written on the left side here. It's some base to the power of some index or power or exponent comes under a few different names. Um, and then you've got, it's equal to some basic numeral. So we're normally used to writing numbers in this form. So say hundred, we want to start thinking about how to write them in index form, because then we'll be able to apply our index laws and log laws to them as well, very, very easily. So for example, hundred could be written as 10 to the power of two. One on a thousand could be written as 10 to the negative three from one of the index laws. Uh, and then we can also think of things in standard index notation. So standard meaning a base of 10, um, used a lot in scientific kind of contexts, to some power x. Uh, and this is often used to represent orders of magnitude. Um, and then it's also used in scientific notation, which we saw before in that simple example that I gave. Uh, then you've also got natural forms as well. And so this is where you use Euler's number as the base. Um, and so you'll see this in both exponents and in logs as well. Um, these often come up in a lot of scientific equations. Uh, and then in evaluating logs, a really quick way to think about it is when you're doing a standard log, because again, this comes up a lot in the equations, is you're really trying to count the orders of magnitude. So if you're doing a standard log with a base 10 to some number, if it comes out as one, then that means that you're talking about an order of magnitude of tens. So X is in the tens. And an easy way to tell that is you can see 10 to the power of this number will roughly put you in that order. So 10 to the power of one is, is 10. When it's two, that's representing hundreds, so 10 squared. And then three would represent thousands. So again, if we had log 10, I'll use an actual number, log 10 of a thousand, that would actually be three. And so that indicates that we're in the thousands, obviously. But even if we were to do log 10 of 4,000, we might get something like 3.4, right? Or 3.5. And so really we're in the threes, which means that that represents the order of magnitude, means that we're somewhere in the thousands. It's a good way to guesstimate. Um, and likewise, if you go backwards into negatives, then it goes into fractions. So a log value of zero represents 10 to the zero, so that would be ones. 
and negative values represents fractions, so tenths, hundredths, thousandths, and so on. And I've just circled here three, six, and nine because these are the most common in terms of units. This is your kilo units, um, then you've got your mega units, and then giga, because every thousand or every three orders of magnitude, we often change units in science as well. So look out for those. And then in terms of a shortcut, it doesn't work perfectly. It won't give you an exact value, but you can estimate a value very quickly. If you're trying to do a standard log of any number, basically just count the number of digits after the first digit, and it'll give you a rough estimation of it. So if we ignore this one here, and then we take the others, however many digits there are here will be the value of the log of it. So if we were trying to do 1,367, and we're trying to get the log 10 of 1,367, we ignore the first number and there are three more digits. That means that the log value should be somewhere around three. Um, and because it is higher than 1,000, as soon as you go above zeros here, then it means that it's gonna be three point something, but it won't go above four like that. And so that often allows you to ballpark it and that's usually enough for what you need. Uh, then finally, just some uh, small tips on this topic as well. So I've already mentioned express everything in index form uh, with the same base as well so that you can apply index laws and you'll see that happening a lot. And then also anytime you can see an index law or a log law that can be applied, go ahead and apply it. It's usually gonna be helpful to you. Uh, and then some other small skills that you can do, the top one very likely actually, uh, switching between logs and exponential forms when you're solving an equation. My trick to this is I just think of it as base to the answer is equal to the bracket. Let me spell that right. Um, and the idea is that is equivalent to a log expression where the base is the base, the number at the bottom, the bracket is the bracket, answer is the answer. So I like to use non-mathematical terms. So that way then if I was trying to switch or convert between either, these are the two equivalent forms. And I always just remember base to the answer equals the bracket like that. And again, I'll point that out when we come to it. And then lastly, base switching. This is very, very unlikely um, to ever need to switch the base on a log and re-express it. But if you needed to say, express this log with a new base of I've chosen C, could be any number though, then it's the fraction of log of the new base of the bracket divided by log of the new base of the old base. A quick way to think about that though, to remember the rule is I just think of a line like that. And then that tells me, okay, it's log of B over log of A. And then I put in my new base like that. Very, very unlikely to ever come up, but it doesn't take all that long to know. So it may come in handy, at least you'd know it then. All right, so straight to applications, right? So we've got the Arrhenius equation here. Um, this one, uh, ACES seem to love this uh, this rule, they use it in a lot of the uh, questions and it seems to come up a lot. Like I think I saw it in the, um, the March sitting from memory, this did come up, uh, which again, people saying that like, it's not content related, it's obviously not a content related exam, but it doesn't mean that they can't use content based equations and understanding them. We're not gonna look at the chemistry of this, we're just looking at the maths. But this is partly why I go through all the crash course videos and everything, because familiarity with formulas is still gonna be helpful. No, you don't need to remember definitions of all of the variables. They generally will explain them all for you. We just wanna know how to mathematically manipulate it or to interpret it. But again, understanding it and playing around with it a little bit beforehand is gonna mean that you can answer questions more quickly. You can probably skip some of the reading as well. So we're gonna do a couple of different skills here. Because maths is all about solving, I'm not gonna do multi-choice uh, just because it's generally maths questions don't rely on multiple choice reasoning. You're usually just solving an answer and then answer, like, then finding the answer in the, in the solutions. So solve the ratio K2 to K1. So we've got, we're trying to isolate this. So I just kind of focus on that and I need to basically push everything else to the other side of the equation, right? And in that, there's gonna be a log that's gonna kind of stuff stuff up. So if I was to do that, the first thing I'd have to do is just divide the 2.3 across. So that would give me EA on R, T2 minus T1. So I just think of this as one big lump. And I divide all of that by 2.303. And that would be what the log of K2 to K1 is gonna be equal to. And then I can use my base to the answer is equal to the bracket. I'm trying to unlock the brackets here. So my base is 10, my brackets are K2 on K1, and this whole giant thing is the answer. So then therefore 10 to the power of EA on R times T2 minus T1 on T1, T2, all over 2.303, 
that should equal the ratio of K2 to K1, just like that. So being able to manipulate it without numbers in place is really good because then you can just practice the skill. It's very quick and it's all very theoretical, which actually develops your math skills a whole lot faster than working with numbers. When you put numbers in, you're more likely to get bogged down in the details when really the numbers are going to be different every single time. So it's good to just manipulate them with the variables in place like this to really test your ability to manipulate the formula. So that would just be the ratio. And then the second thing is not really about logs and exponentials, but more so just about how do we interpret this, right? So how many times greater is K2 than K1? So whatever K2 to K1 comes out as, let's say we do all of this um, and we get something like 10 to the power of, and you do all estimation techniques, which I won't bother with because I've done that in a previous video. But let's say it comes out as like 10 to the power of 3.3, right? Then what that means is I can use my estimation techniques here. So 10 to the power of three is a thousand, right? Orders of magnitude. Um, and then 3.3 is a little bit more, but it's not so far as four, because that would be 10,000. So I'm somewhere between a thousand and 10,000. So I might say something like 3,000. Complete coincidence with the 3.3, it could be 3,500, could be 4,200. I don't really know, but um, I'm gonna say roughly that. So therefore K2, I can times the K1 across is 3000 times the value of K1, just like that. So whatever that factor is as an estimate, we'll then point at the answer. And then solving T1, so a different way of looking at it. Let's say we had to solve this. It's a little bit more complicated here. So let's just write it out 2.303 log 10 of K2 on K1 is equal to EA on R times, oops, times T2 minus T1 over T1, T2. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna do it with numbers first. So let's just say that I know everything except for T1. So you'll probably feel more familiar doing it this way. So let's say we just have 10 over one. They usually use relatively straightforward numbers. Let's say we have 400 over here. Um, this is 8.31. It would give you that in the question. And let's say that T2 is gonna be uh, 298 and T1 we don't know over, and this would be 298 times T1, just like that. And so now we're gonna kind of manipulate it around a little bit. So we can already do a little bit of a log law here. Log 10 of 10 is one. So whenever you have the base and the brackets the same, they cancel out. So you just get 2.303 equals. I might simplify this while I'm at it as well. So 400 divided by eight is around about 50. And then this fraction 298, and I've now just gotten rid of the logs. So it's no longer a logs question anymore. Like this, so then I have 2.303, I can divide the 50 across. And I might actually change the 298 to 300 now just to keep it even cleaner. So then 2.303 over 50, two over 50 is one over 25. So it's a little bit more than one over 25. So I might say like three over 25, like that is equal to 300 minus T1 over 300 times T1. And then it's again, just more math. So 300 T1, I'll times that up. I'll get 900 T1 on 25 is equal to 300 minus T1. I just have to collect the like terms now. So 900 over 25, 25 goes into 100 four times. So four lots of uh, nine is then gonna give me 36 T1 is equal to 300 take away T1. I can add that 37 T1 and T1 should be 300 over 37, which again, I'm just gonna go, that's 300. I'm just gonna say 40, but know that if I've made this a little bit bigger, I'm underestimating this. So then I'm probably gonna adjust upwards slightly. Then I can cancel out the zeros. 30 over four would give me 7.5. So therefore I'm just gonna push it up a little bit. I might say nine or 10, and that should be enough to, not Jules, uh, that'd be Calvin. That would be enough for me to work out what the answer would be. Now, if we were to manipulate that without numbers, I'll just come over here a little bit. So let's write down the rule again, 2.303. Standard log of K2 over K1. It's EA on R times T2 minus T1 over T1, T2. So we're basically following the same steps, but because there aren't evaluations happening, there's gonna be a little bit more to go through. So we're trying to get T1 on its own. So I have to leave all this. This doesn't have T1 in it. So this will all stay. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna times the R across so I can put the R in. I might just put it over here 
and divide the EA underneath, and that leaves me with T2 minus T1 over T1, T2. Then I can multiply the T1, T2 across. So now I'm going to try and keep T1 as separate as possible. And I'm going to put all of my letters together, so 2.303. I'm going to put the R and T2 uh, together in front of the log, just a little bit neater. And then I'm just going to put the T1 outside there like that over EA. And I'm putting this as a fraction, so this is like my coefficient of T1 because I'm getting ready to collect like terms, T2 minus T1. So now I can add T1 this way. So I get 2.303 RT2, standard log of K2 over K1 over EA, T1 plus T1 is equal to T2. And then I have to factorize the T1 out here. So then I would get 2.303 RT2 log 10 K2 on K1 over EA plus one, all multiplied by T1 is equal to T2. So now I've got T1 isolated. So whenever you're trying to solve um, a variable, it has to be in one place in, able to, to, in order to solve it. So then we're just dividing by all of this. Now, again, keep in mind, very unlikely that you would have to actually do this specific skill for a question. Sometimes they have questions that get you to re-express things, um, but it's pretty unlikely. But being able to do that means that you'll be more confident doing the maths and realistically, you'll have numbers in there. So at any point, you can actually put the numbers in um, and then things will whittle down to a much, much simpler fraction. Cool. Right. So next up then, uh, ranking pH in order of, actually, no, I've got a little bit more here. I've almost lost it. pH and pOH. So we've got these three or really four rules written across the top. They generally, from what I've seen, give you these rules and don't expect you to know them, which is kind of nice for people that are coming from a non-chemistry background. People that have done chemistry are probably already familiar with these to begin with. Um, so what we're going to look at here is how to express pH in terms of OH, just manipulating the formulas. So again, looking at it from a maths perspective, not a chemistry perspective for the most part. So of course, we could always say pH is negative log 10 of the uh, proton concentration, but we want to express it in terms of this. So a simple way is we can just say pH, right, is equal to, we can solve this one here, 14 take away pOH, and pOH comes from here. So therefore pH is going to be equal to 14 minus the negative log of the hydroxide concentration. That's what we wanted in terms of. And there we go. Then the double negative makes a plus. Just like that. And that would be the pH. There we go. So then the next one is uh, ranking pH in ascending order of uh, proton concentration. So with this one, you could use your uh, knowledge of uh, the chemistry itself. So we know that low pH is equal to high proton concentration. So if we want ascending proton concentration, that would mean we want descending pH overall. And so therefore, if we just had a bunch of pHs like 3.0, 4.5 and 10, we know that then if we want increasing protons, we want decreasing pH. So basically in that direction, 10 would be less than 4.5 would be less than 3.0. Remember, this is not pH, but the concentrations related to those would be less than each other. Um, you can also prove it with the formula like this. So if we rearrange this for proton concentration, we can first stick the negative over here. So negative pH is equal to a log 10 like that. And then we can do base to the power of the answer is equal to the bracket and rearrange it and get that formula, which again, you might be familiar with. And now we can just go, okay, so 10 to the negative three, 10 to the negative 4.5 and 10 to the negative 10. This is clearly the smallest. This is clearly the largest. So ascending order that way, same answer. Uh, and ranking pOH because pH and pOH have to add to 14. We know that if one is increasing, the other is decreasing because their total has to stay fixed like that. So that one I've just thrown in as a little bit of extra chemistry revision. Um, so it would just be the other way around then for ranking the pOH. 
Uh, then we've got this one here, so ranking pH based on solubility. So this is a good example of how you can apply maths um, to very, very quickly answer questions. So say we have three different salts, um, hydroxide salts, and we've got lithium hydroxide, sodium hydroxide, and potassium hydroxide. We're given all of the molar masses of each, and then we're also given the solubilities at a particular temperature per 100 ml of uh, solvent. We'll assume it's water. So what I would do to break this down, the way that I would think about it, is I'd go, okay, so I'm trying to rank them based on pH, right, if they're all saturated. So the first thing I do is go, okay, well, pH is 14 minus pOH, because that's really all I have available. And then I would realize, oh, wait, I'm missing that. So then that would link me, okay, how do I get pOH? And I go just on like a little treasure hunt, basically, just following the unknowns until I get to a point where I can start. And then what I will have done is plan the question backwards, and I can just follow the steps back towards the start again, and that should be the order that I need to do it in. So that way then I can kind of do it blindly and not really have to predict where it's headed. So if I need to get the pOH, I go, okay, well, that's the negative log 10 of OH concentration. I don't have that. So where would I get that from? And I go, well, that's related to the concentration of the salt from the dissociation equation. Um, I don't yet have the concentration of the salt. So that would link to the solubility. So I'm going to start there. So if I do that, let's just do lithium, sodium, and potassium, right? And I'll keep them in the columns. So in terms of the uh, concentrations of the salt there, that would be number of moles, which would be mass over molar mass. So if they are saturated, then for the lithium, I must have 12.8 grams in the 100 mil sample, right? But then to turn it into moles, I have to divide it by its molar mass like that. Uh, and then from here, I might actually do number of moles first. Like this. This one here, same thing, 111 over 40. And this one here, 108 over 56, like that. So once I've got those, right, I might estimate them. So 12.8 is roughly 12 over 24. So I'm going to say 0.5. Remember, we're working upwards now. Um, 111 over 40 is around about 2.75. I'm just going to say 3. Right? Because again, we're just estimating. And 108 over 56, I'm going to say around about 2, like that. Then I would have to do mole ratios to the hydroxide, but luckily they're all single hydroxide, so they're all uh, got a 1 plus charge on the metals. So therefore, the number of moles of hydroxide is going to be exactly the same. So therefore, I can get straight to my concentration of hydroxide by dividing them by their volumes, which is 0.1, which is effectively timesing them all by 10. So that would be five. This one here times it by 10 would be 30. This one here, you can start using pattern recognition. Uh, then the next thing I would do is then you have to get the pOH. So then you have to negative log them. So then negative log of five, negative log of 30, negative log of 20. And then this is where we come into trying to evaluate them, right? So this is uh, below 10. Log 10 of 10 is 1, so this is less than 1. I'm going to say 0 0.6. It's not going to be 0 0.5 necessarily. Log scales are not linear. Uh, and then here we're going to go with um, negative, and that would actually be negative as well. So then this one here would be negative log 10 of 30, so it's more than 10, so it's more than 1. Um, but then it's less than 100, so it's less than 2. So I'm going to say 1.2, and again it's a negative log, so I'm going to put a negative on there. And then this one here, 20, it's going to be less than 1.2, but greater than 1. So therefore, I'm going to say negative 1.1, right? There we go. And then finally, it's just pH is equal to, so 14, take away negative 0.6. So 14 plus 0.6, which is 14.6. This one here, 14 plus 1.2, so 15.2. And then 14 plus 1.1, 15.1. And so then I can rank them. So here, if I wanted to rank them in ascending order of pH, then that would mean that it would be the lithium. Oh, why is that not right? There we go. Lithium has a lower pH than the potassium, which is lower than the sodium, and vice versa if we wanted to go descending order. There's a bit of a shortcut that we can take, though. So what you could also do, you would have noticed that we can use the inverse relationship between pH and uh, proton concentration and then hydroxide concentration. So lower pH means higher proton, which means lower hydroxide. So therefore lower pH is the same as lower hydroxide. So therefore increasing pH means increasing hydroxide as well. 
So I can use that relationship there and then I can just rank them from the hydroxide concentrations, which was back here. So therefore I can immediately just go, okay, five is less than 20 is less than 30. So therefore lithium is less than potassium is less than sodium. And I don't even have to do any of the log stuff whatsoever. So next up then I wanted to go just through an example where you can use some assumptions using maths equations. Um, and in this one, looking at logs. So if here we have this for Gibbs free energy uh, is negative 2.303, which is the standard log of 10, by the way, um, R times T times log 10 of the equilibrium constant. If delta G, so Gibbs energy is less than zero, then what is K, right? And we can still solve this. It seems like we don't have enough info, but if you just take it as an equation, if you say this is negative, so let's just say negative delta G is negative 2.303 RT log 10 of K. Well, because temperature is in Kelvin, it can't be less than zero. So it's always a positive number. R is a constant. That's always a positive number. So really, if we try to go solving for K, we can actually work it out. So negative 2.303 RT would get us to the log. The negatives now cancel. So now we have a positive. And so if we wanted to express this, we would go, well, 10 to the power of some positive number. Right, which really I could just write 10 to the power of greater than zero. I usually did that is then going to be equal to K, right? And so therefore this is definitely greater than zero. Then I can apply the limit. So if, if it was 10 to the zero, that gives me one. So therefore 10 to anything greater than zero would give me something greater than one. So therefore K is greater than one. Um, we can also do examples like this. So say we had an equilibrium system, um, 2A plus B going into 3C and back again, and we've got the equilibrium concentrations like this. It says the reaction will uh, be spontaneous if T is greater than what value, right? So again, we can use the concept that spontaneous means Gibbs free energy is negative. So therefore, um, we can use the, the rule again. So we can start off by getting K. We can go, okay, K is going to be uh, the concentration of C to the power of three over the concentration of A to the power of two, B to the power of one. So then this is 0.5. I would write that as half. So it's a lot easier to work with fractions and decimals without a calculator. Half to the power of three over one fifth for 0.2 to the power of two. And then 0.01 is one over a hundred, but we're talking about expressing things in index form. So I would write this one as 10 to the power of negative two like that. So then I would evaluate. So this would be one over eight over one over 25 times 10 to the negative two. And I can bring this and flip it up because it's got a negative power. So it's one over eight over one over 25 times 10 to the positive two, so times hundred. And then here I can times and flip 25 over one times 100 or times 10 to the two. And then I can roughly estimate. So 24 over eight is three. So this is around about 3.1. I'm gonna say 3.1 to the power of times 10 to the power of two. So 310, and there we go, right? So I've got my K value now. So then if I put that, I'm getting a little bit messy here. If I put that into the equation, which was Delta G is equal to negative 2.303 RT log 10 of K. So they said, for it to be spontaneous. So if this is less than zero, so this is a negative, delta G is negative 2.303 RT log 10 of 310, then I can now solve for T, right? So I can even do like this, I could say, just to do it a slightly different way, I could say that has to be less than zero i.e. this is delta G, right? Delta G is less than zero. So if I kind of evaluate bits and pieces, I can kind of pull out what I know. So R is 8.3. I'm going to leave the T till the end. I'm going to put in the log 10 of 310, put the T down there, it's less than zero. And then I can just divide everything, right? So zero divided by all of this. And as long as I know log 10 of 300 is going to be greater than one still, so it's still a positive number, I'm dividing by a negative number. And so when you divide by a negative, it flips the inequality, but then zero divided by a negative um, is still zero. So as long as the temperature is greater than zero, then this particular equation or this reaction would be spontaneous. If we do it with numbers, 
it's a little bit easier. So now if we know that delta G is negative 400, we can just plug it in. Negative 400 is equal to negative 2.303 times 8.3 times temperature, which we don't know. We'll try to solve that. Um, and then log 10 of 310. So T is negative 400, all divided by all of this stuff, 3.03 .03 times 8.3 times log 10 of 310, and we're going to do a bunch of estimation here. So the first thing is I would cut everything down a little bit. I can see there's a negative and a negative. They're going to cancel. Get rid of that. 400 over, I'll call this 2.3 instead. 8.3, I'm going to call 8 to cancel with the 400. And then log 10 of 310, I have to estimate. So uh, log 10 of 100 is 2, log 10 of 1,000 is 3. So I'm pretty close to 2. I might say 2.3, given there's another one over here. So the 8 and the 400 can cancel to 50 over 1. So then it becomes 50 over 2.3 squared, which 50 over... And here I would literally just try to do roughly 2.3 times 2.3. Um, you know, 2.2 .2 by 2 is 4, so it's a little bit more than 4. Um, you know, you could call it 2.5 and go 2.5 times 2.5. It's actually a little bit more than 5. So I'm going to do that. 10 over 5 is, uh, sorry, 50 over 5 is 10. So it's, uh, if we're dividing by a little bit more than 5, then we're getting an answer a little bit less than 10. So I might say a little bit less than 10, so maybe around about 9 or so like that. And that was temperature, so that would be Kelvin. And again, ballparking, right? It's all multiple choice. So yes, I'm making estimations, but the answers would be like, 10 degrees, 100 degrees, 340 degrees, and then like negative zero, uh, negative 20 or something like that, which is obviously not possible. Cool. So then this one, just looking at ratios, so a bit more of a physics application in like intensity of light or a beam or something like that. We're not looking at the physics of it. We're just looking at how to rearrange it and use some of the given log values. So if they give you the standard log of two, uh, sorry, the natural log of two is 0 0.693, and the natural log of 10 is 2.303. And we have this equation, we're just going to express x in terms of a. The goal of this is not because they would necessarily ask you to do this, but because they could ask you to solve x for a given situation. So we're doing it without the numbers to focus on the logs and exponentials. So if we wanted to do that, we have to immediately get the exponential into a log form. So if this is our base, base to the answer must be equal to the bracket and now I can reverse it back into a log so therefore log base e of brackets i over i o should be equal to negative ax just like that and if I want to get x then I just divide the negative a across so negative 1 on a log e of i on i o right simple as that and then finally just a little bit more on ph pka and pkb values as well so this one, a multiple choice question, quite heavy on the rearrangement and the manipulation of the formulas, but a good application of it. So if we're given pKa is negative log 10 of the Ka value, pH is negative log 10 of the H plus value, uh, and the pKa is equal to pH minus log 10 of blah, blah, blah. I won't bother reading all that. And they also give you this general equation for a base dissociating in water to form hydroxide and the Kb expression we've clearly got to express pKb in terms of all the other variables. So what I would do first is go, okay, well, if pKa is negative log 10 of Ka, then that means that pKb would be the negative log 10 of pKb, which let's just go ahead and put this in. Let me do that straight, because that would be a whole lot neater. Like this, so pKb negative log 10, which obviously it actually is, right? But even if you didn't have that knowledge, you could just use the general reasoning from the information given in the question. Like this. Now, clearly that's not there, right? And I can see that a lot of them have BH plus over B and they don't have the hydroxide. So my thinking would be, all right, I need to find a way to re-express the hydroxide in terms of other variables. So then I would go, okay, again, like the treasure hunt leapfrog kind of method. I go, where do I see uh, hydroxide? Go, well, there's nothing else given here, but I do know that H plus times hydroxide is always going to be 10 to the negative 14, like that. So therefore, I could re-express hydroxide 
it's 10 to the negative 14 over the concentration of proton like that. So if I do that, so I can put that into to here. And so now what I'll get is PKB is negative log 10 uh, of, and then I might separate these two here. So BH plus over B, ignore the brackets. I'm just going to be a little bit lazy about it times by uh, 10 to the negative 14 over H plus like that. And so then what I can also do is I can see the H plus, I can say, well, that's the same as 10 to the negative pH as well, like that. So now that's negative log 10. And you can see I'm trying to keep the BH plus over B because I can see that in the answers. So I don't want to separate that. Uh, and then multiplied by, this is 10 to the negative 14 over 10 to the negative pH. We're logging all of this. And now I can apply an index law on this one here. So negative log 10 of BH plus over B times by, and then now this would be 10 to the negative 14, take away a negative pH, which really would be 10. This would become a positive. So let's put that first, take away 14. And we're putting that with a log of BH plus over B like that, negative log 10 of all of this stuff, right? And so then finally, we can now start to separate it all out. So because you're multiplying these two here, we can think of that as two logs being added. So negative, I'm gonna put this in here, negative log 10 of BH plus on B, and then plus log 10 uh, of 10 to the power of PH minus 14. And now if I expand that at the same time, um, I'm gonna go with BH on B and then take away a positive, so take away, then this, I can drop this down at the same time and I get PH minus 14, log 10, 10. And that way then I can get rid of that. Simplifies a little bit more. And now I'm just gonna expand out this bracket at the back. So I've got negative log 10, BH plus on B. This would be take away PH and this would be a positive 14 like that. So, I mean, I could start matching it, but 14 minus pH minus log 10 of BH on B. And then finally, you'll see in the answers, there was no 14. So there was a PKW though. Well, there was a 14 at the end, but um, there was a PKW. And remember that 10 to the negative 14 is the KW. So therefore PKW is 14, which is why the, the pH scale always adds to 14. So this we can actually write as pKW, take away pH, take away log 10 of BH plus on B, and then that gives us our answer. You can see that is C in that case. And there we go. So that is a very, very rapid rundown of everything. Hopefully that's kind of answered some questions um, about how to apply logs and exponentials. I want it to be very much skills-based still. So the key things to take from this are always express numbers in index form where you can, always apply log laws and index laws where you can. And the biggest one for log laws is moving that power down to the front. You can see that came up a lot. Knowing how to switch between exponential and log form. So uh, base to the answer is equal to the bracket. And then on top of that as well, like try to rearrange and manipulate formulas without putting numbers in, try to do it with the variables in place because you'll get a much, much better understanding of how the formulas work and how to manipulate them. Uh, and then that will lead to faster maths when you start putting numbers in as well. There's obviously all the estimation techniques, but like I said, that's not really the focus of this video. I've thrown them in anyway. Um, what I will do is I'll try to put up, uh, may not come up today because this, this video was quite a big one to put together, but um, I'll put up a skills sheet with similar questions. I'll probably put these questions up as well onto the resources page on the math skills table at the bottom, there'll be a, a logs and exponentials page um, so that you can kind of go through them. I'll turn the other ones into multiple choice as well if that's really what you're looking for because obviously short answer is less relevant. But remember that maths based questions are about solving so you don't really need to even check the other options unless you are absolutely scratching for, for what the answer might be. 
All right, cool. Well, um, apart from that, uh, hopefully this has all been helpful. Leave me a comment if there's anything or any kind of feedback uh, that you've got for me. And we've got plenty more. There's some really good videos uh, coming up. Uh, on the weekend, there's a really interesting one on Sunday. So look out for that. A little bit different from what I normally do. And I will see you guys in the next one.